Um, Andre, welcome. It's so good to see you. Uh, I know that we've had an awesome chat already just while we're waiting for the team to get be organized. Um, I had this crazy idea after having the success of the Business Growth Mindset podcast. I thought, how do I evolve this podcast? And how do I bring people that I admire, people that I call top achievers, people that have done things uh, that are extraordinary? Uh, and your name was one of the first that came to my list. And in fact, you are the very first person. So ah. for, 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 for the series. And so- How many nose did you get before I came? <laughs> no, 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 you were great. You were like awesome straight okay. away. But what was amazing is I thought, when I saw that Tracy had locked you in first, I was like, this is brilliant. Because every conversation that you and I have ever had, they've always been very open. They're always very confronting. Uh, we tend to swear a lot, so apologies in advance for, for any of the profanities that may come about from our passion. And I think that's probably the one thing that I've always admired about you from your early days, um, you know, building Vino Mofo, um, and then subsequently where you are now. And I'll get you to talk to me about that shortly. Uh, because I want the our listeners to truly get a picture of where you've been um, and also where you are now. And then we'll dive deeply into the podcast into, I guess, some things that our listeners could benefit from, yeah. uh, particularly in terms of, you know, your experiences. And we all know that, you know, I know for a fact you're an amazing storyteller. So, and so many people learn from stories. Uh, so, Andre, please just introduce me a little bit or to the listeners to, to you, but also more importantly to what's new right now uh, that's kicking some goals, is getting lots of media attention at Good Empire. Yeah, cool. Well, Andre Eichmeier, um, yes, <clears throat> um, serial founder, but hopefully not forever. Um, but have, have, on my second proper business now, I guess. And after about 12 years in wine, building the MFO, left three years ago, because I wanted to do something that had direct impact in the world. I think I was, you know, I was really starting to get aware of, if you, if you, you know, Vietnam Alpha was like CEO school, right? So, you know, you go from two people in a garage and then you start to have to learn all the different bits and pieces along the way to, you know, being, a, you know, having a team of 120 or whatever and, you know, running in a couple of countries and, and having the scale of revenue and, and expenses, you know, just, I guess, the scale of business and the capital raises and all the things, right? You sort of got to learn different things. You got to learn um, at scale operations off a strong framework and processes. You got to learn culture and like culture through degrees of separation, not culture like managing six people in a startup and all those sorts of things. So had a lot of skills, had a reputation um, that was reasonably solid and um, and an ability in hunger and then also there's enormous privilege because I'm white and 49 and, you know. Are you um, already 49? Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. I feel, I feel like, yeah, I've still got another six. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm old, mate. <laughs> old but anyway, so I was aware of all this. You still have lots of hair and I don't have any. Yeah. <laughs> I was sort of like, what are you going to do with that? And I was just, you know, I was so frustrated with the state of the world and, you know, just in terms of just the environment and um, and just the lack of sort of, uh, you know, just it just seemed much simpler to me. Why the fuck aren't we solving all of these things? Like we've got so many people with so much wealth and so many people with so little. It's pretty easy to redistribute that if we all want to. And I was just like, well, is this it, Andre? You're just going to complain about this at dinner parties? Like every other fucking wanker who keeps doing his own thing. Are you, and what's your life going to amount to? You're just going to be like, well, yeah, I just kept building this thing. Or are you going to actually try and use all of that privilege and ability to do something directly? So I left and Good Empire was really about trying to go, all right, as you know, that we're all putting all this effort into convincing, trying to plead with like, you know, governments to change policy, which is if you get it across the line, it's effective. Mm -hmm. But when you're sitting three years ago and Trump is in power and Abbott is in power and Xi is in power and Johnson is in power and these fucking nufties, right? Who are just not, like, they're not built to want this stuff. They're self-builders. They're building their own egos and empires and blah, blah, blah. We can keep pleading and pleading and pleading, but they're not aligned. And so we'll get some stuff across the line through social pressure and demand pressure. But like, why are we waiting like, three-year-olds 
to be told what we can and can't do in terms of carbon emissions? And why are we waiting to be told where our welfare dollars should go? And I'd, like, we could do all of this ourselves if we were grown up about it and organized about it. So I really started going, all right, cool. Let's solve that. Like, so this idea of this nation without borders, like where, yeah, we all wish we lived in New Zealand now, if we were so aligned. And we all wish we, that we lived in Finland for the welfare system. And we, you know, but we don't. So how about we just gather together and organize that way? So then I was like, oh, how would we do that? So that's what Good Empire is. And so we started building you know, it's in April this year, after sort of forming the ideas, built basically a system that would um, both inspire and empower people and organizations to take action in a, in a collective and organized and guided way toward the sustainable development goals and then reward them for it. So build like an impact loyalty program underneath it, sort of. Or in fact, it's a bit more like the Chinese social credit app, which is quite evil, <laughs> but for impact. like. So it's kind of like, as in, you know, social proof and social credit, shining visibility onto people and leveling up, like using gamification to sort of have this system where I'm sort of going to set these goals this year in terms of the impact. I care about gender equality. I care about whatever. And sort of aligning it with that. So that's what we started building as a platform. And it's built, the first stage of it's built. And it was going to launch last week, but we got... Um, blocked from the Google App Store, which was ready first for because our tagline is it's time to save the fucking world. So and we do and bleep they, it out. They didn't like that. And they didn't like that. We thought we'd solved it all, except yeah. it was the screenshot of the app in the store, in the um in the Google Play store that they flagged. And so just a bit of a delay. But it's ready now basically to go out. So it's an exciting time. Amazing. Yeah. So when when do you think that launch will be? Yeah, it's gonna be in two weeks now because we sort of we sort of went, all right, let's scramble it together. But then we thought, oh, this is an opportunity to line up because we built the Apple and the Android versions at the same time. Right. So, okay, which was, you know, because we, that was for an inclusion sort of standpoint. And we wanted, we didn't want to go, oh, sorry, it's time to save the fucking world, but only Android users can use it yeah. first or only Apple users. And so we're now we're going to line them up and slip in a few added features for the launch. Amazing. But it's a closed launch. So we got nine and a half thousand people we, we set a target of ten thousand people around the world to be sort of like first test users yeah and with, with real impact and real product and real challenges but um yeah so they're sort of ready so we'll, we'll launch that and then we're doing a pilot with organizations so we launched like with sort of 20 organizations in we've already started that but they'll start using it in two weeks so yeah it's an exciting time where we've been building for quite a while and now it's all all the things are ready with that first part of being ready. Amazing. And I, you know, I tell you what I really like when I listen to you is you talk about alignment, you talk about purpose, and then you hear that you're solving a really big fucking problem. Like it's to me, when I when I when I hear you, I go, these are real world problems that need to be solved. And you know, you've your mission, right? Your mission is to actually go out and do it and not wait for someone else to do it and try and bring a community on board. You know, that whole philosophy of user-generated content. I think this is where I, I this is what I'm picking up and I'm kind of yeah. like, wow. Um, and, you know, that's something that we, we don't talk about anymore is this user-generated content piece. It was really big, you know, in 2007 and then it got so hard and then so many other easy steps came in. And But, you know, some of the things that you're trying to solve are things that our politicians aren't solving, our world leaders aren't solving. And it sounds like there's going to be this incredible platform that people are going to be able to jump on and contribute. And it almost sounds like a big movement. It is. And it's about, I guess what we want to, we were sitting there going, there are enough people that care in the world with enough means to solve most of the problems we've got, including climate change, if we all mm -hmm. fucking get organized and get on with it, right? But we don't, we feel disempowered, we sit there waiting. And this idea of like, you know, like with World Vision, right? Sponsoring a child. So successful because it wasn't just going, hey, can you give us 50 bucks for, to help fund World Vision? It was like, do you want to sponsor a child? Her name is Nalendri. She lives in Bangladesh. Um, you know, she's four and this is her situation. You go, yeah, okay. 
So you keep giving 35 bucks a month, but you get Christmas cards and you get, hey, no wonder now in year seven in high school. She's doing really well in science. And you, so this, you put a picture of this person on your mantle. And they're like your fourth child, right? And this is, right. was successful emotional engagement. And so I really was like, even though it was largely a marketing wrapper for World Vision, it was a clever one, but I was like, mm. if we just took it project by project, there's plenty of organizations doing the hard work on the ground with grassroots projects, whether it's reforestation projects, whether it's getting a community out of hunger, whatever, whether it's educating or, or, or job, job readying, you know, a woman in, you know, India or whatever, they're all happening and they all just need funding. But what, so we were like, we want to get groups of people that are privileged and have the means to get together and put their hand up and say, all right, cool, I'll solve that. How about we yeah. solve that? And then you solve that and you solve that and together, who knows what we will have solved by 2030. So that's, that's what I wanted to tap into. And look, it's funny when you sit there and um, you sit there and you go, right, so our mission is 100 million people and organizations to help save the fucking world. And, you sort of go, oh, yeah, it sounds really grand and stuff, but it's kind of the only number that'll get it done. And so I do feel a bit weird as a founder because you sort of sit there and go, oh, that's a bit audacious or a bit like you're dreaming or whatever. But then you go, well, no, we have to do that. Like, it's not like, oh, that'd be nice and that'll make it successful. It's like, we have to do that because that's what we're taking on. And because the project has had such a life, like it's, it's been one of those weird things. I don't know, you, you had a bunch of businesses, right? Mm. Insane. And you know when, it's pretty hard work most of the time, right? And so usually you have to do like 15 things and then oversell and over communicate just to get a little bit of traction each time. And, and you're strong enough and you're determined enough and you're persistent enough and you, you build a business. But every now and then when you get that absolutely right solution for the right people at the right time, you get this like slipstream. Mm-hmm. And you get like, or I sort of think of it as like, you know, in old school in a village where people all gather together, form a line to put out a, a fire to move a bucket. Yeah. Like, I feel like the bucket's just moving. Like, everyone's going, that's amazing. How can we help? And so... It feels like that, even from my position. Well, to us too yeah. as a team. And so, so you shift from this sense of like, we're building this. And yes, it's for good, but we're building this from out. And just suddenly, we really shifted about three... Oh, no, no, more, almost six months ago to going holy shit, this has actually got a shot of working, not because we'll be so clever, but because people are grabbing this and moving it along. And we're like, suddenly we had this enormous sense of responsibility to not only not fuck it up, but to actually get it right, like properly right. So we had to switch to this sort of like, we need to be partnering with the best people in the world at this and they're very expensive usually. And like, so we were sort of like, we're suddenly like, we can't like scrappy bootstrap this, even though we still have to do what we can in that. We have to be, every element of this has to be like it's already a hundred million people. And it was really weird. I've never experienced that. And it was, <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. Yeah, it is. But cause you feel like you put your hand up and people have gone, all right then. You know, you put your hand up like every startup founder does. I'll do this, I'll put this in the world, yeah. right? And sometimes they're good in the world and sometimes they're good for you. But either way, you're always putting your hand up and go, I've got this idea, I'll put it in the world. But it's almost like when the universe or all the people in the world go, oh good, okay, thanks, we need that. And then you're like, oh shit, okay. Oh, I will then, <laughs> you know, it's right. weird. It's and weird then you guys feeling. have had an, an amazing funding round and I dare say that uh, you know, your past successes have influenced that to a certain extent as well. And, and I think that must be really nice validation too, to know. But you've also embarked on a very unique approach to raising capital. I, I, I said I wasn't gonna speak about it, but it actually is, I think for our listeners, a really important thing to understand. You are a very creative person, Andre. I mean, you, 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 you were acting before you came into the world of, you know, <laughs> of wine and, and business, but you, you want to just quickly just share, like you guys went out and you, you, you raised a substantial amount of money. I'll let you tell us yeah. the amount it, where you can, but also you, you took on a digital approach, almost a crowdfunding well, approach. Well, it was, it was exactly an yeah. early crowdfunding. Yeah, look, do you know what? I reckon, I'll be honest with you. I expected 
having off the back of the success of VMFO, you made a heap of investors mm. a lot of money and will make a heap of investors a lot more money. It's like financial success and it's growing yeah. and it's still, still, you know, has done well, you know, in my absence and grown lots. And so you sort of think, ah, oh, I expected that if I wanted to go and raise a million or two million bucks for my next venture, if it was, you know, decently thought out, shouldn't be a problem. Surely people go, and this is what I hear all the time, people are like, oh, good, that's this founder's next venture. Oh, cool, we'll back it. You know, but so, you, so you're saying you're disappointed with this? Yeah, I, oh, I wow. found it so hard to raise money from even existing investors who I'd made heaps of money for. And I was like, oh. I know maybe it was just arrogance and ego. And I didn't approach it with ego. I just thought, that's what you do. If someone's made you a bit of money, you're sure. happy to chuck a few hundred grand. You know, if you're worth squid. Yeah, great, great learning experience for anyone that wants to raise money, actually, the point you've just made. Well, no, because most, most of the founders I know have found that easy. I'm like, yeah. well, obviously, I didn't do the relationships with investors thing well enough. But I, when I went two years ago to raise some angel money, it was really hard. Is it because this is so different? Mm. Is that maybe why? Because a lot of founders, yeah, they, they kind of, they stay within the same environment. So it, for an investor, it makes Don't you it get easy. a free pass? No. You made someone... No. <laughs> I've, uh, never, I've never had a free pass. Well, haven't you? <laughs> Let me put it this to you. Uh, this to you, listen. If you made someone two or three million bucks... Yeah. Because they chucked a couple hundred grand in, don't you get a free pass for them to chuck in, I don't know, 50 or 100? Had those people yeah, making money in the first place? I know. That's this the is, question I this ask. This is what I had to learn, man. Yeah. So I don't know, knocking it because a few did, but mostly it was really hard. So yeah. when we actually needed to raise, and look, it was hard because at the time then as well, we didn't really. We were like, we don't know quite what we're going to build. We didn't have this idea of what we're building yet. We were like an incubator. We we're like, we're going to try a bunch of things. But I still thought someone would back that because you know I think what, what the reason some founders work and some don't is because you stick it out. Yeah. And you just keep problems As solving. Jim Collins says, luck favours the persistent. Yeah, but I think that's yeah. absolutely the only consistent ingredient. Absolutely. I, I think everything else is like what makes the thing that you happen to do, but you've got to still be in the game, right? It's a cliche. Absolutely. But, and I think that's certainly what Good Empire has proven. We had a hard year last year. But anyway, so then when we knew what we wanted to do and therefore it was a bit clearer, the, the business plan, and we knew we needed to raise some capital... I was always really excited. We'd just uh, gone through the whole B Corp um, process, right, to mm -hmm. become a B Corp. And, and you really look at some good principles like stakeholder ownership. Like can the people that build, like that work and use your thing to own your thing? It's a wonderful model, right, um, for a business. You get your customers that own your business and can invest in it. It helps yeah. you build it. So we, I really believed in that. And, um, and so equity crowdfunding was this opportunity to bypass – the limit of 50 shareholders to stay a private unlisted yeah. company. And um, and you can go through this, it's not even a vehicle, it's just you tap into, an, you go with a licensed um, platform, in our case, virtual, who are fantastic, and you get an exemption from ASIC and you can have as many shareholders as you want and none of them count toward that limit of 50. So we tried it out and I'd never done it. It was such, a, such an amazing way to raise capital, but, um, it's really like, it's a marketing campaign and it's very exposed. I thought so you got everything on the line. Like yeah. if you don't pull off a successful raise, everybody knows about it. Like mm. it's dangerous, right? Yeah. You can do a private raise quite quietly and if it doesn't really work or so you get on with it and get back to building and then you try it again. And a few investors have seen it didn't work, but then on they go. You do this, you're telling the world, hey, we're raising a million dollars. And suddenly you don't and everyone's like, oh, that's a real failure. I think what really I was blown away with the campaign is that you were allowing everyday people who felt the same emotion, same passion that you do for solving these really large yeah, problems. Yeah, exactly. And I got goosebumps now while I'm telling you that because it really impressed me. I spoke to a lot of other people who then put money in yeah. because I was talking to them. I'm like, I think what Andre's done and captured this time, he nailed this. The, the way they're raising money, it's a it's about getting the whole world involved. And yeah, that's it's good. kind of really resonated with me. <sighs> Just got goosebumps all over me. Um, because I'd never seen anyone do it when they had a for purpose venture. It's getting a lot of traction. So yeah. equity crowdfunding for like for purpose ventures, it's a good model, right? People care about something passionately in the world. 
Like, and it's a vehicle, so you can, you know, you can raise, someone could put 250 bucks in, that, that was or they can put 50 grand in. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. You gave every, everyday people the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that really is why, but I think the campaign got such momentum because I was watching and tracking some of your Facebook ads that were running. And I was, I got my team, and my media company, said, just track that. I want to understand how many times that thing gets shared. And they're like, why? I said, people don't really hit a like button anymore. Yeah. We know people's behavior has changed. So we already know that's a very good metric to understand whether or not someone truly connected with it. I said, but that share button, that tells me how many people really want yeah. it to work. And oh, there was one post that was, I don't even remember the number. I should have actually got it before coming in here. And I stood there and I went, oh wow, this is brilliant. Just in, in the context of how many people, and it didn't matter who I spoke to, from all different walks of life, they knew you were raising. And I thought, Yeah, I was wow. blown away by that too. Yeah. And also, people are pretty humble. Like, I, because, like, we've got 1,700 shareholders now across amazing. the two rounds, right? That's amazing. And so, you don't keep track of who's. Like, sometimes you're on there and you're refreshing, like, a crack addict. Like, look at you. Because every time someone puts something in, you've got some more capital, right? So, it's pretty exciting. From a, from a team mm. perspective, and it's really galvanizing, but, but also like, I would expect someone would go, hey, I flicked a few grand in there, really proud to be on board or whatever. Mm. But so many people that I knew invested and just never said anything. So I would come across it like later when I was like packing t-shirts for them, like, cause we made yeah. some t-shirts and things. And I go, oh my God, why didn't you tell me? Mm. Oh, I just thought, you know, that's cool. That's yeah. really- And I think that's what it does, really nice. especially that real infancy stage for your business. And I think when you it's go- hard to again, raise capital, for like pre-product, pre-revenue. Oh, any business. kind of pre-product is is. I, I know I know people in in med, in the medical space that have, you know, patent technology. Uh, they approach me. I had meetings in here last week, and they're like, Christian, we can't get money. I'm yeah. like, well, firstly, you're trying to raise two million dollars for a product you don't actually need to raise any money for. So no astute investor is going to be throwing money at you, and they're going to want a big chunk of the pie. Well, this is the trouble as well. You have an issue. What can you value this at? And like, because you can't give away 60% of your equity straight away. And like, you're going to raise a couple of million bucks. And that's what I said. I said you have to go with 10 million. You, I said, if you've walked into my office asking me to give you $2 million, I'm going to want 80%. I'm going to tell you right now. And they looked at me and they're but like- But you don't want 80% of a business that, because well, you know the founder's not going to be. So it doesn't work. And that's what I said. I said, it's exactly so right. You've come to me for advice not to raise, not, not to ask me for the money. But as an investor, if you really want, I said, but will you want to work for me? Because you'll be working for me then. Yeah. You won't be working for yourself. And the light globe turned on. It was really interesting. Cause really smart people who had never done this before. Yeah. And going back to your point, it is so hard to raise money because you got to tick so many different boxes. But when you do, and in your case, I think you found an avenue that I think you could exploit further. And I don't use exploit in a negative context. I mean, exploit to give a wider range of unsophisticated investors, the opportunity to join something. I would almost like it to be like a premium, like membership, like it's free mm. to join, or if you want it, 250 bucks, if you want to own some shares, like I, mm. I'd love that as being always on. I would like that for every product that I care about. Yeah. Okay. So are you, you thinking of doing another oh, round like that? Right. No, well. Because you guys have closed the, the latest yeah, round. Yeah, we've closed, closed the round. Mm -hmm. No, I think what we're working toward now is like a, you know, probably like a, like a $5 series. million dollar raise yeah. series A in like April. So, we almost got enough funds to get us through there and still do everything we want to do. It might be a little bit of a pre, but I don't know. There's only like, we did a really rapid fire. Like we, yes. we raised two rounds, five months apart oh. and we still haven't launched the product. Like we were close to launching it, but I think we really pushed it. We got by on the strength of the idea and, and, and the momentum. But we were able to show up there. The idea momentum. of you, you know, the people, people knew you weren't going to let them down. Yeah, at some stage, I reckon you need to deliver. <laughs> at some stage, people are like, you've been talking about this for a while now. Like, Come on, I, <coughs> I, remember, had... I remember you told me about Good Empire. Uh, Elaine had yeah. put on that dinner for the venture capital yeah, 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 yeah. fund yeah. at Chianti. And we, yeah. we, you were like, we sit next to each other and you're like, Chris, this is what I'm going to do. That I'm was like, super early. I mean, when was that? would have been three years ago. Yeah. And yeah. You, you were just thinking about it. We are drinking Chardonnay. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and we are like, 
Okay, tell me more. You know, I'm still just coming yeah, up with yeah. no, it. But no I could idea. see passion and enthusiasm then. And I thought, man, if he can articulate this and it's beyond just a disposable cup. Because remember at the time, yeah, it, was the, totally. it, was, it was, sorry, the reusable yeah, coffee cup. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I, was, I don't get this. And then afterwards when we caught up and you explained it and I was like, oh, wow, this thing actually has legs in terms of what it can do to solve these problems. And I think that's what it is because it's such a complex thing you're trying to solve. And I think that goes to how do you, as, a, as someone who's out there trying to raise capital or even just going to a bank to get money, you have to be so damn clear, right? And everyone has a different bloody perception. So there's, you know, and you, know both, you and I both know, perception is reality. So you've got to be so careful that you are, that you're actually painting the right picture for people. Yeah, totally. And I think it took us a while to, to learn how to explain. We're still learning how to explain what we're doing. Because it's a bit like, like the elements of it aren't original or new or unique. Like, you know, everyone understands what a challenge is. Yep. And everyone understands a social platform now. And everyone understands like, you know, corporate social responsibility or enough people do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's software for that. And so really it's just like what we're creating. Everyone understands what a loyalty program is and, you know, at least for flights. Mm -hmm. So we're just taking a bunch of elements and putting them to something. Um, so, but it's, it's still quite hard to explain to people. And we just constantly got this sense of, and so I think when you're trying to raise money on something, when people sort of go, it's very easy for them to go, Okay, well, I'll, yeah, keep you posted on how it goes. And when you can show some traction, I'd be interested. So that's what, like, Blackbird, they say, I've known, yeah. I've got good relationships with, so Blackbird and Giant Leap and, you know, Air Tree and Chapman. Yeah, 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 Chapman, yeah. they're all like, oh, good, well, let us know when you get traction. I'm like, why don't you fucking help me, mate? Like, I need, <laughs> I need some money to show you traction. And so, therefore, it's, and it's a conundrum, right? Yeah. And they're like, well, can't you just bootstrap it? I can't do this job. I'm 49 years old. I'm divorced. Yeah. Like, I've got, 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 i what makes you think that he's actually been able to exit all of his equity in MoFo? I mean, you're making you're making a really bad assumption here. And this person looked at me and was like, fuck, I hadn't thought of that. And I'm like, this is what you do for a living. How can you not like, think it's about that? And it was not even like the divorce and all the other stuff. Like, to me, it was more, you know, I've got, I've got money tied up in investments that I've yeah. done. I'm doing, you know, a stack of land developments that, you know, most people don't even know that I have those companies. Why? Because I don't want people to know, but... My money's tied up. So if I've got, you know, $26 million of land developments happening, how much more money could someone possibly have floating around? And, you know, kids go to private schools and, you know, St. Peter's and Wolf and aren't cheap. So you sit there and you're like, okay, you're asking me for a hundred grand. Uh, I, I wish I could give it to you. And I, I can sell my car, you know, if you really want me to right. give it to you. We're super privileged, right, to yeah. even be in this position. So I don't, I don't complain or anything, but the reality is... And I did sink everything I had into this business, like everything, the point where I like had no money, like yeah. personally, such like a zero money. Serial founder. But I believed in it, right? But yeah, yeah when, it, when it comes down, like if I get an investor going, and I'm like, yeah, dude, I've put like $260,000 into this and do you know how much money I had? $255,000, like, yeah. and that was a couple of years ago. Like, that's the reality as a founder. So I'm, I'm all in and on the line, but yeah, you're sitting there, it's a weird life. And you're sitting there and you've got significant life-changing capital in a business that you've built, but it's not liquid yet. It's weird. It's weird. Yeah. So you sort of know that hopefully you'll be all right, um, but you're not yet. <laughs> yeah. And, I guess and then you're still in your new startup and you're like, oh. Yeah. And, and I think for me, and I can only speak for me, that is why I, you know, after all my ventures, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to teach other people how to do this. And I go, and then at the same time, I'm going to run my own companies. And the best thing is that I've been able to keep this incredible lifeline of money coming through all the time. Because what a lot of people don't realize is the kind of problems you're trying to solve, they require your full attention. Oh. Whereas the kind of businesses I'm going out to build, they're not exit businesses. They are, I mean, yes, there's a couple of them, but the ones that make me income every single day, because I said to myself, 
after I lost, well, after I had to sell everything in 2009 and yeah. basically live back in the back of a car after you know, semi-retirement, I kind of said to myself, you know what? I'm never going to be in that position ever again. And I almost got myself there again because I went, oh no, I can do this. You know, your ego gets going and you start having 15, 16 companies and then you get spit slapped and you're like, oh shit, I'm here again. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sell everything. And that's what that was my saving grace. So you learn, and that's what I want to dive into now, yeah. um, because that was super informative, and I loved where it went. But what I really want to ask you then, and you know, the big question is, what value, or what do you see the value, right, uh, in in Good Empire? That what is the value that you, Good Empire is going to add to the world? What is the one defining thing, Andre? Yeah, well, so we've got it's it's gonna have impact across 17 different missions that get mm -hmm. us, well, at the moment it's looking like one five hundredth of all of the world's problems, the, the major problems, yep. we've got the potential to solve with a bunch of people. Now, that's not a huge amount, but it's it's a contribution that a bunch of people can get together and go, cool, we did our bit. And now, like, are they all listed on the website? Yep. Okay. Yep. And that's just goodempire.com. It's a million kids out of hunger. Yep. It's a million kids educated. It's, Brilliant. A, it's a million tons of CO2. It's a billion units of plastic. It's a billion trees. We just across each of the sustainable development goals, we take a linear slice and a target for 2030. And that's the impact goal. But that's more huge. than that, the behavior change and the momentum shift that it could create, if we can get 100 million people doing that sort of thing, it becomes habitual and also it puts, hopefully it starts to really shape voting. It really starts to shape the demand pressure on change, industry change, because mm -hmm. people are stopping consuming in certain ways. So that's what we're putting into the world. I guess I see it as like, we want we want to put something in the world that makes people go, oh, I can, I can do this. Oh, cool. Because what you unleash then in people, yeah. you know, we just are like a little gateway, hopefully. It's really a transformation, isn't it? It's not change, it's transformation. Yeah, it is. It's like, and it's empowerment. It's people, and that's a cheesy, like it's an overused word, but it's people honestly going, Oh, now I have the tools and I also can see that I can make a difference if I just actually do this with these people. Mm. That's the idea. You're in the same organizations, you know, just going, ah, we can actually. We've got a lot of power. Wow. And, and, and I believe, yeah, we all know that a movement started with one guy on a mountain, essentially. I don't know if yeah. you've seen that. Yeah. The, well, the MBA video, they show everybody when you're doing MBA, or you know, you've got the man on the mound. Yeah. And it's actually a rave. <laughs> well, it's actually, yeah, the first follower is an amazing principle, right? Because the person that stands on the mount isn't the one that starts the movement. Correct. He, he's the one that inspires the one person. The first follower starts the movement because everybody Correct. just needs the nudge. It's exactly that's right. right. It's and the I most powerful and, human behavior. But what's really interesting is not only has Good Empire already got that first follower who's now building a tribe, and I know you're all about tribes, um, but once the world sees it, I think you're going to have that momentum. So congratulations. I think that's, and I love that, that's, that that's the value that you bring to the world. You touched on behavior. And one of the things that I'm always interested in is people's habits and beliefs and behaviors. And I want to know from you, what is say one new habit, belief or behavior that has improved your life? That someone else, if they, if they, you know, you've done a lot of cool shit. So what is one habit or belief or behavior that is, Will, has it actually improved your life dramatically? Uh, for me, I actually decided to face and take control of uh, money and cash flow. Okay. Like properly rather than I think, sometimes I always felt like I just can't live with it every day because I have to create something that is irresponsible because I don't actually have the funding to do it, but I need to start anyway. So I need to just switch off looking at that. And I think I changed that um, in the last 12 months to just go, no, you're just going to have to put on your big girl pants, Andre, and, and start to actually live in it and look at it and accept all of the realities and then work with them. And that's not easy when you're sitting there going, I don't have enough money to, yeah. to live my life and I don't have enough money to run this business. And there are your starting points. It's nervous work deciding to properly chart it all out in a, in yeah, a cash flow. It's, it's, it's really amazing when you speak to another founder who finally understands real financial pressure. Like everyone talks about financial pressure. And when you, you know, I, I meet people who say, I'm under heaps of financial pressure and then they're eating, you know, one of the top restaurants, drinking, you know, a grand crew of some kind. And you're like, you, know, you don't understand financial pressure. Financial pressure is waking up in the morning 
and saying, I can't pay wages. Can't feed my family. Yeah. And, then, and that's the next step. You know, I can't feed my family. I mean, I, I can't, I always go back and I explain to people when I had nothing and I went from pinup work to nothing, that was almost life ending. Yeah. But you learn how to dig yourself out. And for me, I, some people would argue that I kept digging myself in. Um, and that's because you're dealing with a whole bunch of emotional stress that you don't know how to actually process. Yeah. But it's really true. The moment you can't feed your family, like I never felt that experience because I was blessed. Right? I was a single white privileged male. Um, you know, and all I lost was pride and yeah. ego and money and lots of it. Um, but if I had to endure that now, now that I have two beautiful children and Lucy, I there's no way. I, I'm not even sure how I'd cope with that. And so I put in a whole stack of habits and beliefs and behaviors around how I manage money now. Yeah. You know, and I and I have a certain amount of money that gets put away. And it's it, it a lot of people don't quite understand it. And I can see it. The moment, you know, you 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 just looked at me and said that, I was like, fuck, you've really been there right now and and people you know, we're never vulnerable enough to show that because we think oh you know um i can't show people that i'm in that position i kind of go bullshit when we're in that position is when we should be reaching out to the world to. and saying mate hold my hand i need you to hold my hand right now and tell me it's going to be okay but what i love about what you've just said you went and focused on the one thing that you probably sucked at the most oh, i was terrified i did the Dude, same thing terrified yeah I mean, I've got to say, I did a, a few years ago, I did a, um, it was like Officeworks paid for a few speakers to go and do like a regional tour of small businesses. Mm -hmm. We just gave, went and did, gave talks and then, you know, had one-on-one -on -one sessions. It was all small business owners in regional uh, Australia, right? All up and down, uh, the, all around the coast. And um, I just saw it in people's eyes. Everyone was feeling that soul-destroying um, self-worth destroying pressure and I think when you go through it you actually understand why they call it pressure because you actually wake up feeling like you're in a vice and for yeah. me it was in a vice underwater and I've always had a fear of drowning because I drowned when I was little so yeah. to me I was like if, like it's hard stuff to to deal with we were my team we were on JobKeeper for the entirety of 2020 still in startup mode hadn't thought of the right product hadn't raised any capital um, including myself so I had you know, two families, two households, trying to, out of pride, keep, you know, a, an ex-partner and the kids and myself afloat while still trying to build this business and, and having to accept that my employees, um, you know, the team also, you know, accepted well, going on JobKeeper. Yeah. So we're all on like 1200 bucks a fortnight and you're like, wow, this is a real start. This is what it is to run a startup and you know super excited that we came through it and the idea for this product came at the end of it because that pressure also can 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 hone creativity right but but it's not easy like you live through that and i found i said to my team i said you have a free pass for 2021 mm. honestly you could do nothing in what you've shown me in this loyalty and because you know it's not just them going oh cool we can afford no one could afford to everyone's hand to mouth you've yeah. got partners their partners are going, oh, look, I know you love the company, but we need to survive. Everyone's doing it tough in 2020, right? And this year, largely. <clears throat> when people put in that sort of thing, and you yourself are going through it too. I had to ask my mother to, to loan 50 grand before Christmas in 2020 as a 49 year old, 48 year old then yeah. man who supposedly has built this thing. And, you know, I had to eat the humble pie that, you know, passive aggressive parents put you through with that and, yeah. oh gee I'm like I know I know it's asking a lot and we'll cut, you just have to cut back on your life then I I'm, have, I'm earning 1200 bucks a week like for a fortnight yeah. like and basically on a lot of money to, 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 to actually <clears throat> two families kids private schools I know they're yeah. super privileged I, I do accept yeah take your kids out of private school I know I was trying not to drop any balls for anyone except for myself and that's you know that's yeah. privileged and easy Lucy and I were talking about private school fees just yesterday, and um, she said to me, do we need to do it? And I said, well, you know what I'm like, right? And if I had not gone to a private school after school number three expelled me and I ended up in the right school, where would I be today? Because and she goes, you would have always landed on your feet. I said, yeah, but I wouldn't have had the relationships that I have today. And a lot of those relationships is what's kept me going 
because they're the people that know who the real me is. Because you, you get lost along the journey. I mean, you would have experienced it. I mean, the, the highs of Vino Mofo, um, you know, really, people start to have, have a different perception of who someone is. Yeah. Because like, oh, yeah, they've made it. They're great. They've got everything. They've got their whole life going on. Mate, you don't know what all the pressure of even creating a company like that creates at home or in your life or the, you know, it, the, fr- the fractures that it can actually truly create. And, and I think that people always look at us, and I'm talking, when I say us, all types of founders, as really, really uh, strong people that have a lot of resilience and grit. And I know that you and I did a, uh, an Innovation in the City talk uh, with our dear friend Paul Edgington as well on resilience. And so I don't want to recap that today. And maybe we can find the link and, and, and show other people that, because that was a, a brilliant conversation that we, we, we did. That was right in the heart and soul of COVID. Yeah. Um, you know, when we were just trying to come out of that, wow, almost 14, 15 months ago. But I really enjoyed you sharing that bit. And we just talked about being overwhelmed um, as well, but also tying focus. When you are overwhelmed and unfocused, Andre, um, what do you do or what have you done to realign yourself? Yeah, do you know what I think with me, what happens is it's like the all of the unsolved things constantly swim around, literally circle around my head and swim and swirl. And, and I think I just carry that always. So I think when when the pressure mounts, the swirling becomes a bit faster and I think I start to put my own pressure on the swirling um, to, to, to force an answer or to force pieces to come out. That's what it feels like. So it's almost like when it's not healthy, this just swims around for no purpose and just adds stress to you. You're just going, oh, don't worry about this. You're not solving anything. You're just carrying this shit, right? And then, so I think when I actually sit there and go, I really need to solve this or part of this. I think what I do is I start to start to go, all right, ka, gotcha, there, all right. So you almost one. use the anxiety that 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 festers to then take action. Yeah, but it's not not like not not it's not healthy. So it's not intentionally, but mm-hmm. that's what happens. It's the process that Are happens. You sure, you don't think it's intentional. Look, do you know what? I try to put a, I put a fair bit of work into trying to stop mm. that circle of noise and anxiety, you know, and I'm not naturally very susceptible to anxiety, but I carry a lot of shit around. You know, it's a, it's a real condition, right? Yeah. So I do the same. A lot of really successful top achievers have, and that's why the question's here, because I this series, I really want to show people, right, that this is a real thing. It's not very nice. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's, so, it's horrible. And it's actually a form of um, active procrastination that top achievers do. We actively sit and think and allow things to manifest and grow because unlike normal people who get so overwhelmed and therefore then lose focus, a lot of us, that overwhelmness that, that occurs, that anxiety and that that level of procrastination, that fear that starts to creep in, we go, fuck, you're not going to win, right? And we allow it to just manifest to the right level. There is a, a proper psychological condition associated with it. And I've done a bit of research on it, and for the life of me right now, I cannot think of it. But when I put this question in here, I really wanted to see if... I know I'm not the only person. I know there's lots of other people It needs people to be talked there. about it more. Yeah. Because it's what you really do take on as a founder and as a product of zero security hmm. partnered with zero sure like zero base of security partnered with zero like nobody's like the path is not really trodden so therefore you're the only one really hanging on to this vision and hopefully it's clear for you but you know and then to me i you know we talked about resilience the word that's probably started to emerge more for me is this concept of tenacity because mm-hmm. it partners resilience is probably more of a, a toolkit, right? Like uh, of things you can apply to, 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 to keep adaptive and keep in the game. But tenacity is like just that kind of holding on and while something's trying to throw you and buck you, you hold on until you're there. 
Mm -hmm. um, and it also, to me, it involves a bit of like constant um, out of the box or coming at it from different sides. And that's to me tenacity. And so to me, it's a really good founder word and quality. I think, I think Edison um, used the word tenacity a right. lot. Uh, okay. You know, a man who had 2,000 attempts yeah, yeah, yeah. at creating a light globe and man, like a dog with a bone. I'm not giving up on this. I know it's going to work. Um, and it's interesting. I've got one of my clients um, currently in the final stages of the Telstra Awards right. and tenacity was one of the questions. They didn't use resilience. Yeah. So I think you're spot on. It's really starting to come out. And on that point, right, um, we know that business is not all flowers and rainbows, okay? That, well, we know that. A lot of people still have this incredible perception that, you know, business is all great and you get to drive really nice fancy cars and, you know, eat in the best restaurants and have the best holidays and despite even the fact that now we have COVID. But the reality of it is it's not. What failure experience, um, I guess, set you up for success later? Is there something along, and you and I have, You've done heaps of presentations on failure. Yeah. Um, we've done some together. But what, in your opinion, which failure experience had probably the most profound impact that then set you up for success later on? Do you know what? It's not probably the answer you're looking for. I actually think that it was the success that gave me more of a learning and insight into my failures than the other way around. Okay. I don't actually think... Explain that to us. So I had failed five ventures. No, you couldn't call them all businesses, but they were an attempt to get something built, right? So, you know, one of them was like a covers band that I mm -hmm. owned and ran, but it's still a business. Yeah. You've got five employees and you're booking staff and you've got revenue channels mm -hmm. and, you know, but that was, you know, and a couple of them were proper businesses. And, um... And when VMOFO, I guess, hit that point where you knew it worked and was was going to work, you know, it was less vulnerable to like, you're like, okay, we're at a certain scale, it's proving itself. I then looked back and went, well, why this one and not the others? I was like, well, you had a co-founder who thought a bit differently to you, that's a positive. Um, but was that the only thing? I was like, no, it wasn't. And I was, I was sort of like, it was, it was a mate of mine, we were having a chat about this and and um, we, we were analyzing together, well, what are the consistent qualities that you brought into each business? And it was always an, un an uncompromising um, product idea. Like it was always like, I didn't want to compromise on the product or the experience that the product would have. And what I never did and took, never gave the respect it deserves was the business model or the revenue model. Right, and the combination of those. I don't think they're entirely the same, but you know, the, the combination of those. So I always just went, this needs to be in the world, this is awesome. And I didn't work, give respect to the, um, the the model of who's gonna pay for it and why would they pay for it and where you're gonna start and how you're gonna, you know? So, and it was only, and that was consistent through everything I did. Like even the band, the example with the band, I was like, um, the musicians deserve to be paid this much money and I know that venues can't pay that yet, but they will as we get grown, blah, blah, blah. Just didn't, wasn't in it, couldn't stay in it long enough to have that equation, but wouldn't compromise on the experience because wouldn't compromise on the musicians, wouldn't compromise on the quality of show that we could give. And in the early days still had to take as beggars and choosers the venues that would give us a, a gig. So I carried that same sort of thing. Same when we put a, a theater production company, same with a, a, a few of the businesses, right? Always, always didn't want to compromise on the people and what they should deserve to be paid and the product we will put out into the world. Vina Mofo, the business model happened to be tried and true and worked mm -hmm. at a time, right? So it was retail, there was a deals mechanism in retail, which was pretty um, red hot at the time. And Justin, my co-founder, handled the money. <laughs> so, yeah. so you know what I mean? Like, so, but it still didn't compromise on the product. So, but the business model worked for it. So I think there was hindsight of looking at, ah, I got lucky that we chose something with a business model that worked, uh -huh. you know? Um, and I mean, not entirely lucky, but like, you know, we didn't make up that business model. We certainly, you know, but it, but it worked. It was pretty standard, it, right? It, it's working very By well. Yeah, yeah. So, and then we made lots of good decisions with that business model, but, um, but that was what I learned. And so probably more carrying that into, and I can look back on three years of Good Empire, and I know when I wasn't paying it the respect that 
needed I needed to, mm-hmm. and when I did start to, and the I know how much rigor I put into the thought behind the model, everything from pricing to who should pay and who shouldn't pay, and how do those two things work, and how do we preserve the value for the people who are paying and preserve the impact for the people who aren't paying, but so yeah. much thought, like as much thought into that as every other element of the business, which I've never done before, and I know therefore when I have a conversation with people about the business model, it's rock solid and it's good. It's yeah. really good. And therefore I know that projections really fucking work. I think the really important value there as a takeaway is be incredibly clear, right? Almost paranoid clear that your business model is understood. Yeah. And, not, and that you, but also that it's yeah. not making any assumptions that are too far fetched mm-hmm. um, and put the effort into if it, if it is, then relook at it and relook at it, find yeah. it, find that's, it. That's really Where's good the value like? Yeah. And, and that's never been my strength. And I, I always had the ability, you know, I just didn't give it the respect mm. that it needs. It's interesting. You, you use the respect, the word respect a lot. And, um, and I think a lot of people misuse the word. They, they have a connotation to the word. Uh, I like the way you've just used it to sort of single out the amount of effort that needs to go into yeah. actually being really, really sure about everything. Um, that's cash why I use the word paranoid. Cash flow owns your business. Mm. Cash flow is your oh, boss. Yeah. You are in service to your cash flow. Yeah, and I know that's cheesy, but you are, right? It doesn't matter. So we've got seven objectives. Like we run a tight operational ship because I've got all of my learnings from Vino Mofa and we started that from the beginning. So we're on fortnightly sprints. We've got proper thinking to our... Um, to our annual objectives and then quarterly objectives, we interrogate them well. And then we're like, we are good at execution at Good Empire because we've got it right from the beginning and we've taught ourselves to be really accountable. So we're on this amazing fortnight sprint. We've got, the, and our objectives, there's seven of them that we identified and they are waterfall and they are in order of priority. And number one is capital. Um, and it stays number one until it's solved. And it hasn't moved and it won't move until April. And then we'll have a little bit of breathing space and then it'll have to be number one again. And that's the respect to go, everything else is way more important uh, or feels more important, but this is the end game one. Yeah. We can do nothing without that. And I know that sounds obvious, but until you're therefore putting it at number one and addressing that first every single morning, every check-in, Every check-in on our operations, we address that number one. And I live in that and I do not move on to product. I do not move on to anything else until I'm sure that I've given that the respect every morning. Yeah, I love it. And the reason why I've got this big grin on my face is anyone that knows me, um, obviously for me, cash flow is the thing that I've put all my heart and soul into as well because it was the one thing that let me down. Christian 1.0 and almost let me down at Christian 2.0. Now at Christian 3.0, I got that down packed. Um, It was one of the major drivers for me to go and do my MBA was, you know, and do I major in finance? And people were looking at me going, what are you going to do that for? I said, well, there's just things I want to understand. And, you know, I wake up and the first thing I do, you see, most people wake up in the morning and they check their social media, right? Um, I wake up and the first thing I do is I check every bank account. Yeah. I'm talking I, I'm talking mine and all my clients and I just go bang 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 and I just go because I've access to all, like what I've tried to implement with all my advisory clients is to teach them the same value the same respect that you have to give your inflows and your outflows and you need to know exactly how much money you've got in the bank every single day and you know I'm obsessed by it it's now an obsession and literally Lucy will tap me on the shoulder and she'll be like can you not check your phone in bed it's literally I go Shoom. And it's 4.30 in the morning or 5 o'clock at the latest. And it's like, bang. And I go straight through my accounts. Then I open up all the zero my other accounts of clients and go, bang, bang, bang. Everything's being reconciled. And I know exactly how much money everyone's got. So therefore, when I do my morning huddles with my team, everyone's aware. When my clients are doing their morning huddles and let's say that I'm in one for some whatever reason, I know whether or not they're actually going to be able to speak the same language to their people. Because there is this incredible confidence you get when you truly know how fucked you are or how well you are doing, right? And, you know, people always say to me, what do you mean, Christian? Why is it that you feel like so confident when you know how bad it is? Because then I know that what I need to do to get out, right? And also if I'm looking at it every single day, it never gets bad because I know exactly 
the money coming in, the money going out, and I know how to manage it. And I say to people, forget your P&L, it's useless to you, right? It's a paper profit, okay, or a paper loss. Uh, your balance sheet, sure, look at, look at your current assets, look at your current liabilities, look at the longer term. That's a good indicator of the health. I said, but your cash flow, which most accountants don't tell you to look at because it's a complex thing. I go, it's not complex at all. It's inflows and outflows, keep it simple. Yeah, I actually don't. I, I mean, we track it all in zero, but I, I try not, I sort of, to me, knowing what's in the bank account is really just a reconciliation. We've got it just a really accurately, uh, I, so we've got a monthly forecasting strategy yeah. and I, re, I re-interrogate that every time I have new information. Mm-hmm. So it's probably weekly, um, but, uh, but as you know, just make sure it all lines up. And then all I have to do is like check the bottom line, which is the flows and, yep. and no month, but, but then I use, when we get tight, I switch to a weekly um, mm-hmm. cash flow forecast, which is actually Absolutely. running the bank, yep. actually outgoings and ingoings rather than projections. And, then, and I think that's really good advice for anyone listening is most companies should work on monthly and or even 90 day cycles with a monthly. And then when times are tight, you go straight to weekly. And that's a big mistake a lot of people don't make. That's why I like the way you just sum it up. We normally work to monthly, but then when it gets tight, we're at weekly. You know, to me, I'm just, as I said, I'm obsessed. I look at it daily. But that's truly cash flow management. Like being, yeah. Like the projections are more having an awareness of your financial position. But like, you know, you'll put in like gross salaries mm-hmm. and you know, you'll have your super and your, and your PAYG lumped into that month along because you track that. But as soon as you're in weekly, you go, right, when does that bill fall due with everything? Yeah. When do I have to pay super? When do I have to pay quarterly? Whatever. And that's, that's management. I, I don't like to live overly in that if I've got enough runway to not have to live in that mm-hmm. weekly thing because it's not no longer necessary. Like, See, I love it. Right, I don't I've, like it. I've got, Andre, I've gotten to the point where I, it's seriously, it's the one of the best things that I, that's why I love when you said that was one of your best new habits, I was like, oh yeah, I, I, I got excited. Like, <laughs> well, what it allowed me, it allowed me to, to know that we were, you know, um, three months ago that we were going to run out of cash in three months, even that, you know, probably, yeah. and that sounds like a simple thing to know, but as in, not really. There's a lot of founders who don't know. I also knew then that like, oh, we might not have product in market by then. Mm-hmm. So we might. So three months before, we were able to go. Well, what are the levers that we can pull to raise capital to get us through? And the surest one we knew was another equity crowdfund round. Yeah. And they were like, it's too early. I'm like, it's right. We've got. We've done a lot in these five. And you months. did really well in that second round. Yeah, really well because we we knew what we had done and we were able to tell that story. Um, but what was good is I almost like we pulled the trigger back then, but almost like six weeks ago, I reckon I got to a point where I went, fuck, we got it fine. I was like, what am I an idiot? Like, I know this was all on paper. Why did I, but also I think you have to almost, well, you don't have to, it's not good business, but I still carry this sort of like fantasy Mm -hmm. that it'll somehow magically all work out which is not very healthy, but I don't know. You I need mean, a little bit of that layer. Do you think, no, I'm, I'm gonna pull you up on that because I think it's easy to say that, but deep down you knew exactly where you were, right? Like yeah, but I was also like, like why didn't I worry no, about this? I'm not conscious of someone then. listening to this and not listening to everything that we've talked about. Mm-hmm. I, I think that that misrepresents you. I know definitely you knew exactly where you were but you, you have to go to the edge. This is what people don't understand. Yeah. You want to be an outstanding founder. I mean, you right. think that Mark, uh, you, 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 you think that the boys from Atlassian, that, that Cannon Brooks and Farkas there did not, were never once at all on the edge when, you know, I was I was up against them in, you know, the Entrepreneur of the Year program, like in 2007, and they were like 21 years old. I mean, at least I was 28 right. or whatever it was, you know, these guys were in their 20s and, you know, they were on the edge because they had to bring in heaps of money. And, you know, they since then have been, you know, they've started Blackbird, they've got a whole bunch of early investors in all of these big companies like Canva and Coltrap. They've probably learned the same things, but there are critical elements for all of us, no matter where you are on the journey, whether you're, you're raising big money, whether you're a small business that's got to go to a bank to get money. There are times where we know we are going to be in an insolvent position if we do not achieve this. 
And, you know, I mean, we have safe harbour rules now that can protect us from that. And there's, it's finally great that, you know, the insolvency rules are changing because I think before everyone at one point has been insolvent. Yeah. And it's like, excuse me, that's fucking business. Like, I've got to get from A to B to C to D and shit, until I get to Z, it may have taken me a couple of manipulations. You know, I, I, I meet some businesses, and I digress a little bit, but I meet some businesses who when I walk in and do you know, an inventory check, and these are 10, 15 million dollar companies, I'm like, uh, your balance sheet shows me that you have got an ATO debt. How? Oh, you know, we, 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 we realize that they can essentially lend us the money at 8%. I said, you realize that's insolvent trading. As, as, it, as it appears now. And they're like, shit, didn't know that. I said, so if you want me to be the chairman or on your board, that needs to be wiped out. Not for any other reason other than you need to move it. But I know heaps of businesses, I did it in my early days, where I was maneuvering that kind of money to give myself cash flow. Would I give that advice? Absolutely not. But the reality is sometimes when you're at that edge, you, you, if you, the key that you have to know is you have to know that you're there. And I think that's what you demonstrate is you knew that you were there. I don't think you can kick yourself for going, oh, shit, didn't know that I was that close to it. Of course you knew you were there, right? Yeah, I did. I think it was, a, no, what What for me was like, I think I had to have a reminder of, oh, hang on, this takes longer than you think because there's also the month after you've closed the round that you have to wait for cooling off period. Money. And so I was like, oh, shit, that's right. We've got to stop this now. I literally was like, and, and, and my CEO, Tash, she's amazing. She's like, we have the bandwidth. We're launching a product. We're doing this, blah, blah, blah. I said, I know, but we've got to do this now. See, that's like, right. Like I, tomorrow. And then we're on the phone to virtual just going, and they're going, oh, cool, yeah, look, maybe later in the year. Like, when are you thinking? I was like, no, we're thinking about in like launching in eight days. And they're like, it took you four months to turn this around. Yeah, but we're practice now. We're going to launch this in eight days and we have to. Yeah, <laughs> and and you're, like, you're all about that. Jesus. Like, <laughs> even you, who's a seasoned person in this space, and I, I'm, I'm really, really grateful that we've had this chat today because... Even, even I take for granted some of the shit we know. And we, I assume that, you know, someone like you who's already been through it, and, and, and you know, look, there's no, no point in, you know, in, in bending around the bush. Vino Mofo has been a wonderful success, not only for you guys, but for South Australia, because it was all done here. Essentially, you know, yes, it's the officer in Melbourne now, but you know, even now there's a South Australian at the at, at, at leading Vino yeah, Mofo, yeah. you know, from, from South Australia, um, huh? yeah. yeah. So, well, Paul's actually in here, I think, tomorrow. So, Justin, right? Justin's back, yeah, in and, and Justin's yeah, here. Yeah. So, it's amazing that you know, and I look at that, and it, but all the learning lessons that you guys went through, and you were also, I really admire what you, you and Justin did because no one else had been was doing that. Like, you know, the amount of effort you guys put into speaking and going to events and that shit, people don't see that that, that is all extracurricular, right? It's not like that people are handing out massive 20 grand engagement speaking gigs to you. No, you're doing it because you have to build your brand and you have to make sure that then you're at the forefront of people's minds. So when they're thinking of buying amazing wine um, that, you know, is incredibly well priced, you know, by the way, I picked up a shit ton of Parole the other day. Um, I so <laughs> I had no choice. I had no wine to drink. But, you know, I think that they, that's the wonderful thing about why I wanted this series to come alive, was to show people that even though we are perceived top achievers, right, we go through the same shit they go through. It's how we handle ourselves that defines us. I think it's really important that if you can tell that story with this podcast so that people, we need to be able to see... We need to dispel this myth that founders are some, you know, superhuman, you know, mutant gene that, oh, that's not me. That couldn't possibly be me. It's a bunch of basic things that you, you know, yeah, you got to be smart. And yeah, you got to be passionate. And energy is an under um, spoken about quality. It's well, grossly undervalued. Do you know what? When I, when we, um, Years ago, when we um, sold a big chunk of Vinamofo to Catch of the Day, mm -hmm. sitting in the, in the just immediately um, as we were, they were talking, they were just about to say yes to the deal. We're sitting in the room with these are really elite founders, like Gabby and Hezzy back then, and their team. They were elite founders. They were just smart yeah. and good and sharp and still are and done amazing things. We're sitting there, and one of them, um, Anise, who was probably the smartest guy in the room, um, he was like, Everyone was talking about, oh, what we like about the business. He was just like, to me, and he went, energy. I think I see that you've got it in spades. 
And I was like, what do you mean? Like, like yeah, I've got a fair bit of energy. And he said, no, no, it's everything. Mm -hmm. I was really like, I didn't understand it until later and you realize, yeah, God, how, this would be hard work if you don't, can't continually top up. Yeah, you gotta engine. be in a peak state all the like, time. Yeah. And people don't understand that. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's, it's it, it, you know, I'm glad you met, I put a note here because I actually think that's probably the biggest takeaway for anyone listening today is also I'm reflecting on how we communicate today. You know, I know that the people listening aren't actually in the room with us, but hopefully they can feel the impact of our own energy when we talk about stuff. And you know, hopefully the video they'll be able to capture the smiles and too, even when even when we know it's shit, we're smiling because it's like, well, you know what? We got to get on with it today because it's not yeah. shit today. <laughs> <laughs> it was three days ago, and it might be next week. That's it's right. Not and look, the important is that energy doesn't mean extrovert. Mm. And energy doesn't mean you know, it's whatever. It's just it is that like constant layer of passion and tenacity, however that manifests in you. I think it's really important to also um, make sure everyone knows you don't have to be an extrovert. I just made that, I just wrote that down because see, it's easy for guys like you and I who are a little bit extroverted, we are happy, I mean, I'm incredibly high on the extrovert level and people think, oh, it's charisma. No, 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 it's not. Energy is very different. It's how you lead your people. It's how you drive. It's how you delegate. Uh, you know, if you have to motivate people every single day of your life, you're failing at how you're running your business. You need to inspire them, right? And you need to inspire action, but also you need to have the systems in place. And I think anyone listening today, they should have heard the word sprints, huddles. You know, these are these are methodologies that are being founded not by you and I, but for no. masters that have come before us. They really were. And it's a handbook, right? And people always say, Christian, that's gonna be your new book. You've got to write this handbook. I said, what do you mean? The handbooks already exist out there. And this is the question I want to ask you. Google's now. OKRs. It's mm -hmm. start with Google's OKRs and it gives you everything you need in the framework. And then just try well, I'm glad I'm glad you just gave a tip because what I was gonna to say to you is if you could recommend a couple of tips to anyone listening. You know, someone, someone smarter than us, someone more driven than us that's thinking about getting into business or has a small business. And, you know, it might be the local electrician. It might be, um, you know, a mum and dad boutique. You know, what, what, what is a book that they could go and read that's going to transform their life? Or what is um, some resource that you've used along your journey that they could tap into and it's going to, you know, create change or give them that transformation they need to step up. Yeah, so I really, there's a book called Scaling Up. Um, by Arnish. Arnish, that is, I got, the Atlassian right. boys actually gave it to me. Yeah, um, they, they actually hired Vern to do that, all right. that originally, yeah. Right, and look, it's, it is a good manual. I'd sort of read it at a time when I'd probably instilled a lot of things myself, but it's a really good guide for all of the steps to setting up because it's called scaling up because it's really, you know, you could, you could go and read like, um, uh, what's the startup um, book? The Lean Startup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric Nice, yeah. I mean, it's been updated, but but to me, I prefer the idea, like I didn't set up Good Empire like a Lean Startup so much as, as soon as we got, knew what we were going to do, I really set it up more like a, like a scale up business. Like a grown up. Because it's as important to organize three people tightly uh -huh. as it is to organize 300 people like and as a startup like you, your biggest challenge is focus and prioritization and because you can only you can't execute on a tenth of what you need to yeah. so you need to get the tenth right and it's a good framework for that that's probably good i also just think um what is it whatever it takes to stay inspired so sometimes that's like someone's biography you know, sometimes Whose like, biography would you? Oh yeah, do you know I read a really cool one, which was the um, it's called Shoe Dog. Yeah, which is the Nike. So, no. Yeah, yeah. And what I liked about it is is because it reminded you that even that company, at that time in startup mode, they were just making shit up as they went and desperate things and nearly <laughs> collapsed and they were being scrappy and they were being tenacious and then they had self doubt and then they had like you know it was really like it was really and that's kind of what business feels like in its first few years all the time and for every single business, yeah. whether you're IBM or whether you're Facebook or whether you're Google or whether you're Nike, or you're like it just does. It feels like a bunch of people getting together, making shit up as they go, learning fast, 
you know, being bold and then being afraid and then all that stuff. Yeah. And it's nice to read open, proper biographies around that because you lose sight of that when you see a big business. Because they've already, you know, they are tighter and they are more accountable now and they do have processes and they do, but that's all taken a while to bake in. And, but they're still, you know, if you get insight into the upper echelons of like, you know, the exec team at Telstra or whatever large company you might think of, it's still, they're still getting in a room making shit up. It's just on a, on, on, on a higher scale. You know, it really is consistent. So I like, I like reading books like that because they remind you that you're not in a different world. This is actually what business is. And I'm going to say, I've, I've read Shoe Dog and I was, uh, everything you said really hit home. Um, and it's quite amazing because I've never been a reader. Yeah. And it wasn't until uh, I had breakfast with, with someone and uh, they recently just done a big exit of their business. And uh, he said to me, he said, go read this book. It'll change your life. And I was like, and you're a really smart guy. What was it? And you're young. So I need to, it was Limitless by Jim Quick. Yeah. And he picked up that I struggled to read because I didn't know how to read. And in that book, Jim Quick teaches you how to read. I went from, you know, and I wasn't a slow reader because I'm chairman of a lot of boards and so I've got to read a lot of board papers. So, you know, I was about 220 word a minute reader, which is not bad. I'm now at 850 because I've learned these techniques and they're the kind of books that I love when I can grab them. Scale Ups is one of my favorites. I actually, all the strategic uh, workshops that I run are based on that methodology, including Jim Collins. So, because what I've done over the last 10 or 15 years is worked out, that's the shit I've got to keep doing more of because that stuff's proven. Rather it's than trying- It's my balance of getting the foundations right, like really put the time into crafting a vision that can inspire people to want to be part of it and know your purpose so you've got that engine and set the set the foundations and then, you know, it takes you like what to consider with a team, like proper thinking ahead of org structure and then into execution and then into cash flow. And it really is a good, solid, you know, you want to, you'll learn to adapt it as you go. But as you said, it's pretty comprehensive. First. Yeah. I mean, you know, scale up for anyone that's listening is really simple because it's people first, strategy, execution, cash. Yeah. And they're the fault, you know, people were saying, Christian, what do you do when you advise? That's it, those four pillars. The rest of it blends in. Yeah. Leadership, culture, all of that blends into people, but people have got to come first. You know, and, and I think that's the wonderful story at, at Good Empire. Andre, I have taken up so much of your time. I am so, so happy with the content that we have been able to pull together today. and. I, I'm so glad that you, you took your time and I know you're busy. Uh, but one more question. Yeah. Who's your business hero and why? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, I probably have to say for a while, I was really inspired by the Alassian founders. Mm -hmm. You know, I think they were the class ahead. And, you know, they were inspired by Bassett and the Seek founders. You know, so we all have a class ahead. And I've been over at that time, that was a class ahead. They really kept going ahead. And then and same... they're still going. <laughs> yeah. And same, I really, like, really admire um, Cliff and Mel and Cam from Canva. Mm -hmm. Because I think I have some insight into, like, they do stay really pure with vision and really, like, and constantly... Yeah, like, I've read some stuff recently. And really well. smart, but really execute well. And they haven't compromised on their culture and really, you know, so I really, they're probably more, um, they're probably the heroes. I, look, I, I admire different people, different things. Like Elon Musk for his, like, just vision. And, you know, he's one of those, like, you know, sort of, I guess, uh, dictator founders. I don't really feel aligned with, I, I don't want to create a company where it's ruled by fear, of, mm. you know, but, but I can admire that level of, attention to detail, carrying the vision for an entire company as, as, as one human and I admire the direction okay. he's placed. So I don't think I would like him if mm. I met him. I don't think he would give a shit, but I don't think I would like him. <laughs> but I, I, I think we need people like that in the world. So yeah, um, different. Uh, I probably have always not put enough effort into finding and, and learning from business heroes uh -huh. earlier times. So it's probably been in more immediate sort of circles. And, and that's a really good lesson there in itself. You know, I, um, I once heard someone say, you have to model the masters to succeed. And, um, and I look back at when I 
was working overseas in, in investment banking or private equity. And you know, it was a long time ago. It was over 20, 22 years ago now. Um, and um, that's when I first heard that. And I was when I came back and started my own companies in Australia, that's actually what I did. I went out and said, who are the best? Yeah. And I'm going to model them. And do you know what? Along my journey, when I you know started believing all the same bullshit that everyone was telling me that, hey, Christian, you're at the top of the food game. Now you are the guy that everyone's looking at. When you start believing that shit, you forget to model the masters because you're the so-called master. And the point that you just made then, there is always someone at a time better than someone else. You know, like, you know, Scott and Mike, they had people before them. Um, and now they're world leaders, but I guarantee you, they're looking at Apple. They're looking at Google. They're looking at, what are those people doing? You know, Canva really is a unicorn in its own niche, there isn't anyone else doing really what they're doing, but they're staying true to their original vision, as you put it. And I and I think that they've got really good advisors around them. They've got really good quality people around them. But you know, you guys, you guys you know, had Vino Mofo. There was what, Wine Library. There was a couple of other people before you, really. But I think you did it in a way that was different, and you allowed a certain culture to come through that organisation. That allowed you to sell more and you you know it's all the steps that you took um i i know that everything that you're going to do at good empire is going to crush it I, I just know it because it's for purpose and i think that makes a really big difference and i can see it you know you, you today have demonstrated why you are a top achiever and top achiever doesn't mean the amount of money we have in the bank and the amount of success that we've no, had. No, in my you know, case. No, <laughs> but for anyone, Andre, you yeah. know, like yeah. I, I always say to people, you know, Christian, what defines to you success? And I say happiness, you know, well-being. At the end of the day, if you're not happy and you're not mentally well about what you're doing, right, and you don't have purpose, you know, my straight line is live with purpose, you know, I don't do anything unless there's a bloody good reason for it, you know, I'm not in here taking up your time um, for no good reason, I know that, that what we've talked about today is going to help someone, and the reality is that's all I want, I want, if I, where I can any time is be able to help someone have a better life than I've had or someone else has had through our learnings. That's that's my entire motivation. And I think that, you know, what you've got planned at Good Empire is something that we should all get behind. And more importantly, at least drive interest around it. Because if we can solve even one of those massive problems, then you've contributed to society on a level that the average person can never contribute. And I think that's amazing. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I, did I just summarise that for you? Yeah, it's good, it's I, good. I, no, but it, it, I feel yeah. it, Andre. And I think it's really important for anyone that's going to listen to this episode to, to really understand that. And I encourage them to, to head to the website, learn what the, 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 the 17, is it 17 missions yep. yeah, that, that you guys are trying to do and, and to really rally behind that because it's, it's all well and good to raise money and to go out for a seed round but you need the consumer to be involved and oh, yeah. to really get that user-generated content driven and going. And, you know, I, I, I don't have a huge following, you know, 15, 20,000 people, something like that. Um, but I know that my tribe are loyal to me. It's not just some scattergun approach tribe that, you know, I'm not going to go out there and have 2 million followers that I can't engage with and get to know, you know. To me, it's about having the right people that I'm connected to that help me on my purpose yeah. and I think that you know I want to get them to rally behind just jumping online and just having a look have a look at what Andre and his team are doing and and if something resonates with you then get behind it and then yeah. hopefully that'll help you guys get your your you know your series a uh round sorted and you raise that five million and then you know we're flying and another amazing South Australian success story can come to fruition at your hands so Andre I want to deeply thank you not only for your friendship but also for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here today and share, I think, a really cool hour or so. Um, and we bounced around a fair bit too, which really I love about doing that. And maybe we'll have to get you in for, for another one <laughs> or another topic. But Andre, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. And um, yeah, and we'll put up some links when we do the podcast as well so people can actually dive in and have a look. So yeah. thank you. you too. Cheers. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. Appreciate it.